a better way to spend a Sunday morning than filming World War II warbirds. Mind the traffic, Ted? Um, Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport, where all the, uh, the business jets land, all the posh people. And two warbirds, B-17 Flying Fortress and a B-24 Liberator. In the films they look big and huge and menacing and powerful. Inside they are small, cramped, they are so tiny. Not only is it a great thrill to see these warbirds in action, it's also fascinating and very humbling to meet the people who actually flew with them during World War II. These aircraft are part of the Collins Collection, a non-profit educational foundation whose purpose is to organize and support living history events and preserve historical artifacts. Since 1989, a major focus of the Foundation has been the Wings of Freedom tour. The stars of this tour are the two fully restored bombers and a P-51C dual control fighter. I'm John Barry B-U-R-1, originally from New Jersey, now living in Florida for the last 30 some years. I was a navigator in uh, uh, the 8th Air Corps uh, back in World War II, stationed in Holbrook, England. Some of them were very easy missions, some were not too good. Every position in a World War II bomber demanded intelligence and concentration. But the job of the navigator was probably the most cerebral, requiring lots of number crunching to get the crew safely to and back from their target. John's station in the bomber was a glass enclosed office in the plexiglass nose at the front of the plane. The most exposed section to enemy flak and fighters. During the war, more navigators were killed in combat than pilots. The navigator table was like a piece of plywood, uh, about two by three. Incidentally, the lead navigators did not have any machine guns because we were expected to do our math work instead of shooting at enemy planes. On one particular mission, we were coming back, crossing over the Zyder Z, and uh, at that point, uh, our intelligence didn't know that there were any flak installations, but the Germans had put, put the flak guns on barges. And uh, we descended uh, down to 10,000 feet, and at that point, the Germans started shooting with the uh, flak guns, and uh, it was a very, very rough flight. We lost a couple of engines, we lost our hydraulic landing gears, we lost our brakes, we had uh, fuel leaks, but thank God I got the uh, plane into the first airfield in, in England right over Zyder Z, and the pilot, after landing, uh, steered over into the grass, and the weight of the plane just sunk the plane into the ground, and that's the way we stopped. One of the pilots of the B-24, Pappy, whose father worked on Liberators during the war, takes us through some of the trials and tribulations that the Collings Foundation have to face when keeping these warbirds airborne and active for other people to watch and enjoy. Little jack screw right here. A lot of times, because of the weather and oil and stuff, it'll stick. So what we'll do is, if it happens to while we're you know, doing a run-up or something like that, it won't work. We shut down the engine, the cannon goes out on the, uh, on the wing and hits the governor with a hammer. <laughs> what happened was it broke off and it was bouncing around on top of that piston. And then it got at a certain angle and the piston actually shoved it right out through the top of the cylinder. Uh, it's not like a jet, it's a handful. It's hard to taxi it. Uh, it doesn't want to maintain directional control. It just it, it's got a uh, swivel nose wheel, so like a bad shopping cart sometimes. <laughs> the brakes are touchy. You press on them and nothing happens, and so you go, oh my gosh, so you press harder and all of a sudden the pulse gets all the way down to the, down to the wheel. And it doesn't have any anti-skid. You can blow these tires on a landing real easy. Uh, once you get it airborne, it's just like any other airplane, except it's very heavy on the controls. It doesn't answer right away. One of the things it does do very nicely, if you're a little 
fast and you're a little high, you do what they call a side slip. Actually put the fuselage to yeah. like this. This airplane does beautiful side slips. <laughs> that big old fuselage right there really is very nice. <laughs> It took off into the sky. I really wished I was up there with those guys. I stopped worrying about that and flew back to England to tie up some family business. Where, after a conversation in a local pub, I made quite a discovery. The 390th Bomb Group, part of the 8th Air Force, had been stationed just down the road from my parents' house in East Anglia during World War II. I set off to find what was left of this airfield. I've just got lost and ended up on a little back track. It's somebody's farm and they've just shooed me off. Saying, no, no, we don't want you here doing that because we're bailing. Well, they've said the control tower's the other way and I should make my way there. Finally, there it was. The now restored control tower belonging to the 390th Bomb Group, part of the mighty 8th Air Force. The size of these airfields is very impressive. They cover a huge acreage, massive chunks of the English countryside, put under concrete and asphalt for the bombers of the US Air Force. Now they're going back to crops, land and pasture, swords into plowshares, I guess you could call it. But these big skies with a variable English weather would have been where people would send off those lads of 19, 20, 21, cross over to Germany to bomb the hell out of the Reich and then hopefully come back. The small market towns and tiny villages around here suddenly had this influx of visitors. Young, vibrant Americans, some who've never been outside their own country, who suddenly found themselves in a foreign land. Lots of different people and different customs. Sometimes almost like a foreign language. Definitely a different kind of type of beer. The local church, which dates from around 1370, also had a connection to the American aircraft and men I'd recently been filming. In 1917, remains of a B-17 were dug out of a small hill near the village. It had taken off just after Christmas 1944 for a bombing mission over Germany. It failed to gain height and crashed, destroying the chapel. All nine crewmen on board were killed. And the history of the churches is often actually found in these very simple little kneeling mats. And we have a very special one here, which is a very special link. As luck would have it, a few days later, I got a call from Banyan Air Company in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to say the commemorative air force was coming to the airport and would I like to film them? So back over to Florida it was then. The Commemorative Air Force was formerly known as the Confederate Air Force. It's a Texas-based non-profit organization dedicated to preserving and showing historical aircraft. It was established in 1957 by five friends who scraped together $1,500 to purchase a P-51 Mustang. Off on another adventure then, Pax. Yep. Yep. P-17. We only got the call yesterday. So we've had about 10 hours to get this shoot organized. They suddenly said, do you want to come down on the flight from Fort Lauderdale to Miami? And she said, yes, didn't we? we're going up in a B-17 into the wide blue yonder on a wing and a prayer. At least the aircraft is here. You can see them over there just um, wandering around, kicking the tires, tapping things with hammers. And the ground crews just arrived as well. Watch us at work and ready to go to left. Okay. This is a B-17. 
B-17G Flying Fortress. This is one of the last 20 B-17s ever built, so it's one of the youngest that are still in existence. And they took out a newspaper ad, believe it or not, an actual newspaper ad. And we still have that newspaper ad, but for $50,000, the Commemorative Air Force bought themselves a B-17. For $50,000 today, you can overhaul just one of the four engines on this aircraft. Right at them. This is the radio room. And this entire room here is operated by one guy. This was state-of-the-art for 1944. And you'll notice all kinds of big black boxes all over this place. And this is what was necessary in order to communicate between planes and between headquarters back in uh, Britain during 1944-1945. The uh, radio operator went to school for a full year back then in order to learn how to operate all this equipment. The limitation for communicating between planes was about 50-60 miles, which means if you want to communicate back to base in Britain, it wasn't going to be by voice. Uh, when we're on tour, we're working anywhere from 12 to 14 hours a day. Uh, when we're back at the hangar, uh, it's three days a week and the guys are out there about 12 hours a day. But it's a labor of love. Uh, there's plenty of these uh, planes that are in museums. Um, and you really don't get a perspective of what these planes really did for you by just looking at one. If, unless you can actually tour through it and actually fly in it, the perspective just really isn't there. I took my first flight in this B-17 in October of 2012 and it literally changed my life. As with many other things in life, there was a lot of paperwork to get through and pre-flight checks before we could get off the ground. Have a hatch there, forward hatch, that would, would release with just a, a small amount of pressure. Ted. Again, this is hold harmless. We're just we're just making you aware of that, and we're asking you to sign this document to uh, to note that we made you aware of the situation. We were also trying to arrange a last-minute helicopter shoot to film the bird in midair, uh, but we were running into problems with time, schedules, and of course the tower. Trust me, you'll know who that is. The tower is always very excited to talk to the B-17. Okay, well, uh, it's, it's your call, Jim, with uh, with Charlie there. If that's gonna if that's gonna work or not. Yeah. Okay. I'll get with Kevin and um, we'll see if that's that's possible. I haven't got access to the tower to get permission. In other words, it wasn't built as a commercial airliner. It isn't intended to be a commercial airliner. It's a it's a seventy year old warbird. It was built as a you know World War Two type bomber. So there are sharp edges. Ow! Bloody head! Ow! Jesus! Be a midget. <laughs> there are uh, places that you do not want to touch. Thank glad you very you, much. Glad to have you flying with us. Pat Elliott, he is your PIC. Let's go. Get my kid on board, I suppose. Yeah. Kevin had warmed to the idea of filming, and so he put me in the nose of the B 17. The safety briefing was very, very thorough indeed, outlining places I could and couldn't stand, and where I could and could not go within the aircraft. <laughs> Don't step on this, why? You fall out. Don't step on the bomb bays, why? They open. They have a spring on them so that if one of the bombs dropped during the war, rather than keep a live bomb on an aircraft, which is not desirable apparently, uh, the bomb bay doors would spring open and drop the offending bomb, no matter where you are, over southern England or France or Germany or whatever. They would drop it. And the bomb bay doors do the same if something over 100 pounds drops on them. I think I'm slightly over 100 pounds. So if I drop on the bomb doors, <laughs> look out for me a 995. I'll be a, just a bloody red speck. In 1935, when this plane was designed, it was the largest land plane in the world. As small as it is today, it was the largest then. We talked about uh, Boeing building an aircraft that was specifically designed to take combat damage. And uh, when you do that, you take a lot of the, uh, the power and conveniences away. So everything is manually controlled. There's nothing hydraulic in any of the controls. Uh, the only hydraulic uh, controlled items in the entire plane are the brakes and the cowl flaps. That's it. Uh, today we were four people to fly this aircraft. Uh, two pilots, a flight engineer, and then a loadmaster scanner that's in the back of the air. Um, all the gauges here are completely original with the exception of this one and this one. Oh, and this one. Sorry, we got three gauges that are different. The uh, instrumentation has been simplified as much as possible. What pilots don't need is uh, over, overly complicated gauges. And then obviously we've installed modern uh, GPS and radio. So 
So the GPS replaces the navigator position in the nose that we've talked about, and the radio replaces the entire radio room in the back that we'll talk about. As Kevin had pointed out, one of the best places to get the most dramatic shots would have been in the nose cone. It was also the most precarious. And up here we have a, uh, one of the famous Norden bomb sites. Uh, and during World War II, this was the uh, most accurate bomb site in the world. Uh, supposedly this was able to drop a bomb into a pickle barrel at 20,000 feet. In uh, reality, it was not able to do anywhere near that, but this was uh, the state of accuracy at the time. Um, the bombardier sat in this seat right here. During the bombing run, he took over from the pilot and literally flew it using the bomb site. So he would give uh, left and right and forward and all the uh, connections to get the bomber on target so that he could drop the bombs as accurately as possible. That's it. And that's all it is. Plexiglass plastic. That's all that's separating you from bullets and minus 45 degree air and everything else that's out there in the world. So. Very safe today, but during World War II, it was a pretty nasty environment. You get uh, bullets through here, these things shattered. You know, there were numerous B-17s that came back, but these things shot out, which means you had 160, 180 degree air flowing through the bomber for the rest of the remainder of the flight. And if you didn't stay in formation, you were sitting duck and shot down. With little further ado, I was bundled aboard, eager, excited, and not a little nervous, as she is a 70-year-old aircraft. But it is a B-17. So I guess this is it then. Cheer, right. Do you um, want to see you later? Yeah. Miami, here we come, eh? Take good care of it. <laughs> Once safely installed inside and reminded repeatedly about where I could and could not stand, the air crew went through their startup routines. Yeah, well, this kid's set up to go. Uh, we're going to go fly following into the west of the uh, municipal areas. Uh. All right, let's crank them. The mighty right cyclones were cranked over in turn. The noise level went stratospheric. And the plane shuddered and strained let loose from the ground. The bomb bay doors were closed. Kevin took up position in the nose and we started to taxi down the runway. I was getting to grips with filming inside this noisy, cramped, and uncomfortable aircraft. Then it was full throttle on all four engines. And we were away, into the warm Florida skies. Whilst it was a great thrill for me, flying in the iconic B-17 over the Everglades, it was sobering to recap on some of Kevin's walk and talk throughs on the previous days. This was, after all, a powerful weapon of war, manned by some very tough and very scared young men facing a determined enemy in hostile skies. This is the tail gun position. This guy was the most isolated of all the crew, but he was also one of the most uh, important he protected the entire tail of the aircraft. Uh, it also made him a target for German fighters. If they could knock out the tail gunner, they could pretty much have their way with the aircraft. He ran these two 50 calibers right here. He did have some armored glass back here, so he did have some measure of protection. They had to hand off fighters. A fighter was coming in from that quadrant over there, and then coming this way, the tail gunner would first engage him. And then he would come over here and basically hand him off to a waste gunner who would then hand him off to the navigator gunner. And that would all happen within about a second and a half. 
So these guys are in constant uh, chatter on their own little intercom system. And there were three gunners here. You had a waste gunner for each side here, and these are 50 caliber machine guns in these huge uh, boxes here. You had about 650 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition, and that seems like a lot. This is all they carry. It's about 80 seconds worth of ammunition, and that had to last them for the entire mission. The mission lasted anywhere from six to 10 hours combat conditions for about half of their mission, so three to five hours. So three to five hours of defending off German fighters, and you've got 80 seconds of ammunition. I have to admire Kevin and the team, most of whom are volunteers, who dedicate so much of their time, hard work and enthusiasm to this mission. Under their generous and informative guidance, we passed majestically over the Everglades, into the urban sprawl of Miami. The wheels and flaps came down, and we executed a perfect tail dragger landing on the strip, taxiing to a halt at the local air museum, where more young people could learn to appreciate these historic aircraft and the exploits of the men who flew them. Well done to the Collins Foundation and the Commemorative Air Force for keeping these warbirds and history airborne. Crank them. Well, what a good way to spend a Sunday morning. Pete's gone to church, huh? Not going to church again. Last time it was trouble. Thank you.